immunocompromised dog that then re receives an infective dose of the strep zoo epidemicus, or strep zoo as we call it, and then uh, that bacterium can go crazy, so to speak, and cause a very severe, very profound hemorrhagic pneumonia. That is the concern that we could have this disease get out of hand and see multiple, multiple cases per day of this. We've not seen that yet. We're going to be taking some very proactive medical steps to treat all animals that are showing the slightest signs of respiratory disease with a highly efficacious antibiotic for this particular agent. One of the other dangers of this agent is it's usually resistant to the most commonly used antibiotic uh, for canine upper respiratory disease in shelters or in the veterinary environment. So it's really important that we catch these early and we treat them proactively. Uh, the most important thing I think for the public to know is to be on guard if a pet is adopted from a shelter or co-housed environment, be it one of our shelters or be it any shelter. Those animals, until they've lived in the home for a few weeks and have normalized and have their immune system rebound and respond and renormalize, they could be at risk for this disease process and their veterinarian would wanna think and consider uh, that in making treatment recommendations. We don't know where this is gonna go. It's gonna be probably 10 days before we are on the other side of this. So if with all these proactive measures, we are normal in 10 days, then we're going to pat ourselves on the back and know that we averted a crisis. There's the potential to have to shut down and quarantine the shelter. And if we get to that level, obviously Jose would be communicating that to the public because we'd have to consolidate and focus all operations on uh, the West shelter. We have not shut down adoptions of yet because we only had one case and because we feel it's immensely important that we do everything we can to address the shelter population as a whole. And the number one thing we can do for that is to move animals through our system rapidly and to place them in homes. So from the individual animal's perspective, if we can determine and find an adopter for that animal, then that helps that individual animal get removed from that environment of stress and potential exposure to any number of pathogens, including the strep zoo. The secondary impact is anything we can do to lower our shelter numbers decreases the stress on all the other dogs that are present within that shelter, also thereby making the, those remaining animals less susceptible to this, uh, to this pathogen process. Any animals that are currently showing respiratory signs in our shelter always receive treatment and those medications are dispensed with those animals when they're adopted with the recommendation that if anything of concern arises or the respiratory condition fails to resolve with the adopter, that they seek care at their family veterinarian. Do we have any questions? Okay, so the question about avoiding dog parks, for family pets, I would not recommend avoiding dog parks for the strep zoo issue, because again, this is something that we see in association with dogs that are already compromised or colonized by another respiratory pathogen and are experiencing the stress of living in community housing. You almost can't get this disease if you're a normal, healthy home pet dog you have to be stressed or compromised by something else. So this in and of itself wouldn't be a reason to avoid dog parks. We have also had cases of canine influenza, which in which case then the discussion is, if your dog is a dog park lifestyle dog, it's a world traveler dog, so to speak, then it's by definition, its exposure risk is much greater and the canine influenza vaccine would be something that a pet owner would wanna consider, again, in consultation with their family veterinarian. Just like we think about vaccines for humans, uh, if I'm a hermit, I could be the I could be the great I could be the next great American novelist. But if I live alone with no social interaction except through the internet, my doctor probably doesn't care if I get a flu shot or not. If I'm an airline pilot, then my doctor's probably saying to me, you know, you really travel a lot. You're exposed to a lot of different populations. This would be a, a highly recommended vaccine for you. And so, and and the symptoms with with the uh, with the strep zoo, oftentimes we have dogs that have low grade respiratory disease. They might have a little bit of a cough, a little bit of nasal discharge, either clear or mucusy. And then if, we, if, if that isn't treated or addressed or is allowed to progress and the strep zoo is present, sometimes the first sign is really acute respiratory distress 
because the bacterium can in infect and cause that much disease process that quickly. They progress from kind of those very subtle signs to very acute and panic signs very quickly, and they can actually be coughing up frank blood. So if someone were to see that in a pet that they either own or had adopted or, or had sourced, especially through a co-house situation, that would be an indication to seek emergency care. And that's not the sort of thing you're gonna wait and you know, well, my vet doesn't have a, an appointment available for three days. You're gonna wanna go to one of the excellent 24-hour veterinary hospitals in the Valley. And those dogs, some of those dogs do pull through and you can pull them through, but they do require some very intensive care, antibiotics, uh, oftentimes intravenous antibiotics, uh, true ICU level support and oxygen. Any other questions? So, I just wanna give you guys an idea of what we're doing to be proactive at both the East and the West Shelter. Right now, we are going ahead and stopping our day fostering programs within the East Shelter. We are also going to stop all owner surrenders at the East Shelter as well. We are currently not going to stop adoptions. Um, again, as Leo just mentioned, one of the biggest things that we can do to help the situation is to get the dogs out of the stressful environment. So instead, we're actually going to extend these free adoptions. We're gonna extend them through the remainder of the week so this way folks can go ahead and get these larger breed dogs out of the facility. Um, a lot of our larger breed dogs are what we're seeing the biggest problem with within the two shelter facilities. So that's why Wes will also extend it through the remainder of the week as well. Um, we really don't want people to panic here, but it is a stressful situation for the dogs as well as anybody who may have recently adopted one of the animals. So we do want, if anybody has recently adopted the animals, uh, an animal from our East Shelter facility and they're seeing that perhaps the animal's acting lethargic or not at its best, please get that dog to a vet immediately. We also want to recognize Two Pups Wellness Fund as well as Arizona Animal Rescue Mission. Both of these groups are coming forward to help us out with not only medication, but any kind of transfers that may need to happen to get these dogs out of the facility. So both of those groups, again, we've called upon them. They immediately step forward and are supplying us with the medication that we need as well as anything else that will help to save these dogs. Do you guys have any further questions? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that's very important for everyone to remember with this disease process is that we didn't see this 20 years ago or even as much 10 years ago in the sheltering system because the, the, the focus of the sheltering system has changed. When we have shelters that were just designed to hold animals for three days, which was the legally mandated holding period, then those animals came and they left quickly. They either left in a happy way or in an unhappy way, but it didn't, it didn't matter to the overall population of the health of the animals in that shelter because they were coming and going quite rapidly. When we have animals that are dwelling longer because we're doing our utmost to work with their medical and behavioral needs and to get them rehabilitated and into homes, that's when we see issues like this start to come up with co-housing. And this is what's changed a lot of us in the, in the sheltering world's thoughts about what, it, what a good shelter should be in terms of caging size, in terms of airflow, and in terms of making that shelter environment so much more rich for the animal because anything we can do to reduce stress is going to increase that animal's ability to fight off infection and remain in the shelter longer while we work on finding it its forever home. So it's really a holistic approach that we have to take in the shelter environment because if we don't do that, then inevitably these, these guys will get sick. It's almost a scientific fact, or it, I would say, I would argue that it is a scientific fact. If we stress any animal enough, it's going to get sick. We joke about it this time of year because it's cold and flu season if we have to travel too much or we have a stressful job or we work too much overtime, we go, oh gosh, I'm gonna get sick, everyone else is sick, I'm really stressed. It's the same thing for our, our animals. If we have a cat that's in a small kennel that's stressed because it's never been outside of a home environment, that cat is primed to develop many of the same upper respiratory signs that we develop when, when we get sick. Same for our dog friends. And then this is just a layer added on top of that where a dog that's already compromised from being stressed and ill with something else, then this opportunistic pathogen can come in and wreak havoc. So it's something very important to think about when we're looking at what our shelter does, what we ask our community to do to help us help the pets that are in our shelter, and when we look at you know, redesigning and re-engineering ever-increasing better and better shelter facilities across the nation. Well, 
really and truly, if you adopted a pet from us, if that pet's showing any signs of respiratory illness or issue, so coughing, labored breathing, if you look, I always like to look down the side of a dog because dogs are different from us. We're flat this way, where dogs are flattened that way, so you're looking at the side of the dog's chest. I always look at the side of the dog's chest as well as their abdominal muscles. If they're using a lot of effort with their chest walls, really huffing and puffing to breathe, especially when they're at rest, if they're laying on the couch. I'm not talking after they spent just spent 20 minutes catching Frisbee. I'm talking if they're just at rest and they're putting that much effort into the work of breathing, that means they've got something cooking there and they definitely need to get into the veterinarian. In terms of this particular disease process, the strep zoo, again, you're almost, it's almost unheard of to see it in a, in a pet population. Uh, they did a survey in New Zealand of dogs or pet dogs living at homes, living on farms, and it's of everything they cultured from those dogs, 1% of the time they could even find this bug. And those are dogs that aren't even sick. So it's very, very, very low incidence in dogs that aren't living in stressed, crowded uh, conditions with other respiratory pathogens going around. So then it's not unusual for you to have this happen in the same vicinity? This is the first time we've seen the strep zoo in our facility here, and we hope to get it under control. And if you have a pet that you've at home and you've adopted one from ours, would they be kept apart? If you've adopted a pet from our facility in the past 10 or so days, then we always recommend close monitoring for that, any respiratory pathogen at home, because there's, there's a host of bacteria, there's a host of viruses that can cause canine upper respiratory disease. And we always recommend that if you're taking that dog home on medication, that you would keep it separate from your pet at home. Jose has a list of the, the clinics that anyone with us. Anyone who adopts a dog from us automatically gets a free wellness check of that dog. So the exam would be covered. We hand out a, a list of veterinarians to those uh, individuals who adopt a dog from us. Um, they would then, if they found something in that individual pet, would probably place them on antibiotics. Right now, we're only concentrating on getting the pets within our care up to speed and as healthy as possible. Um, if there are folks that find that their animal that they adopted from us was sick and they are trying to deal with this, they can contact us if they need that list of veterinarians that they need to go to, and we would help them as much as possible. And then, and you may have I, I could not address the exact route of how, how it became infected. We see this across the nation with shelters, and certainly in a community such as Phoenix, where we have a tremendous number of stray dogs, we have a tremendous amount of urban living, and we also have a lot of very rural living with all sorts of livestock. It's not hard at all to imagine that this bacterium that is resident in large animal areas would easily come into our facility because we know a lot of these stray dogs. You know, when, when, when I tell fa folks that I live in Phoenix, people always think of a city, but I can drive very quickly and be in a, a really rural setting in the city of Phoenix, and those stray dogs come into us too. So we're kind of the perfect spot for this sort of cross exposure between species. And then what stage is the results? The test results we got back yesterday. So we put this plan together yesterday through this morning. It, it's almost, it, it really wasn't, I didn't really have a, 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 a shock reaction because we've been seeing it so much in the sheltering world and because the longer we keep animals in a facility and the more packed a facility is, the more likely something like this is gonna come up. So it's almost, it's basically my, my, my perspective on something like this is it isn't in keeping this out of the facility, it's in being comfortable and confident in being able to manage it within the facility. You know, we know, we know sooner or later we're gonna have a disease process creep up in any large animal co-housed facility. So when things creep up, we have to be confident in our ability to deal with it. The team and the resources and the network we have and the partnerships we have with other agencies and other entities to deal with something like this. And that's part of the reason why we are stressing that we need to get as many animals out of our facility because currently 
we're not sure if we're going to have to transfer animals from east into our facility. If those animals start transferring here, we need to quarantine them in one area and keep our animals in another area. We're already at extreme capacities at both shelters. So that's why we're going to go ahead and extend those free adoptions to get as many animals out as possible so that we can create space here if we need to transfer animals over from east here and do whatever we need to to keep all the animals quarantined and safe. And, and David, are we looking at Right now, we're going to try and treat as many of the animals that we see any of these symptoms in. Um, again, this is treatable, and as Dr. Egar just mentioned, getting them out of a stressful environment is key. So if we can get an animal out of a stressful environment, put them on antibiotics, if we have them already started on antibiotics in the shelter system, those antibiotics would go home with the adoptee. They would be treated, and they would potentially have a perfectly healthy pet. But the uh, fact of the matter remains that right now they're in a stressful environment. We need to get them out and get them healthy. And then, Dr. Christina, one last question for the process. Sure. Um, how has this spread, how is this, how is this, how is this spread from animal to animal and from person? The spread is airborne, so through sputum droplets or through fomites, so anything that comes in close contact with the dog and then comes in close contact with another dog. There is the potential for this to spread to people. It's, again, difficult. It's not something that would, we would think of as happening routinely, but there are reported cases of it. And anybody who either has a very sick dog or anybody who themselves has a compromised immune system would want to think about that very carefully and weigh, weigh those options heavily. The other thing to parallel with what Jose was just saying is any of the animals that are under treatment for kennel cough or upper respiratory disease in our shelters have always been available for adoption because again, the number one thing that's gonna help those dogs get better is to get them out of this stressful living situation. And when they are adopted, they go home with medications and the vast majority of those dogs straighten up, fly right and have utterly no issue. That's always disclosed to the adopters. The adopters always have the option to take them to their family veterinarian if they don't see resolution of those conditions or if if that proves to be a financial burden, we do tr sometimes try to work with those individuals or accept the pet back, and then we take it to the next step for whatever, whatever additional diagnostics need to be run. Okay, with that, with that being said, that it could spread to humans, now that once they're on a vaccine, are they still going to take it? Because if we're asking people to come adopt the leash, what are we asking, what are we asking people to do? There is always the potential for transmission. No one is going to stand and say that there's no potential for transmission because there's always that one case report out in the CDC literature of this, that, or the other. But in normal living situations with normal immunocompetent immuno persons who practice good hygiene, you really have to work at transmission. I know the one case report for transmission was a exceedingly sick, like as in a veterinary ICU situation dog that then coughed or, or somehow expelled sputum, infectious material, into the face of somebody else, who in, into the face of a person who then inhaled it, that person did fall ill. But that is literally the amount of, of work that it takes to transmit the, the disease process. And obviously, in, in a case report like that, we don't have knowledge of what that person's immunocompromised status is or is not, because we have many people who are living out in the community with organ transplants and things like that. So that's, that's part of a counseling process anytime somebody decides to take a pet into the home. And I would argue that's part of the counseling process anytime somebody decides to take a pet in the home, regardless of the source. Uh, shelters tend to get painted as you know pot potentially being uh, a site of, of dogs that might have an upper respiratory disease. But any, any place where you have animals that are co-housed, it could be the military kennels, it could be uh, a dog show kennel, it could be a greyhound track, o oftentimes you're going to see these disease processes pop up. So there is no really and truly safe, bulletproof, you can't possibly get sick from this dog or this dog can't possibly have an illness that might infect you sort of thing. The, the, the true message needs to be good common sense and if you have, if you yourself are suffering from an illness that makes you concerned, probably maybe even a, a working with a veterinarian or a rescue group or a shelter to talk about the things that you should be worried about and then fi fi finding a pet that fits within those paradigms. 
Uh, I've been a part of sheltering organizations where if somebody had particular concerns like that, they might adopt a dog that was in our fostering program so it never came through the shelter or had been out of the shelter for a very long period of time and was available for adoption but was not living here in a co-housed situation and then we could pay particular attention to any other details for that individual. But it's really because of the, of the healthcare privacy laws and because of people's sensitivities to it, people need to kind of know that for themselves and work with their own medical professionals uh, to get some good recommendations and then come to the table and we're always happy to help in any way possible. I would say to keep it as simple as possible, it would be the equivalent as if, let's say you were a family member and had a child that got strep throat. You would probably keep that child a little bit more isolated. You would probably, if you came in contact with that child, you would wash your hands. You would make sure that you're taking all the precautions necessary not to catch strep throat. So if people think of it in the sense, if one member of your family is sick and you're trying to stay away and you're keeping up with your hygiene, that would be the same thing that you would do if you came in contact with an animal that potentially could have this. Strep zoo. Yeah. Yes. Yes. The, mm -hmm. the, the, the official name, and I, I, can, I can actually get it for you if, if anyone wanted, but it's Streptococcus zoo epide, epide, epidermidis. No, I actually don't it's, actually want to pronounce yeah. it. Strep yeah. zoo is really the best way. Yeah. 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 Strep yeah. Zoo. I just needed to know how to spell strep zoo. Yeah. 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 Yep. And if you Google strep zoo, it does pop It pops up. up. Usually if they're infected, you'll see it between three and five days. So the fact that we're already a few days past when this dog had its unfortunate illness and have, we have not seen a massive outbreak makes me cautiously, knock on wood, optimistic. <laughs>